The early 2000s was the wild west of the digital video world with new companies and older companies releasing their versions of digital cameras, each jockeying for prime position in the new era of camera technology. And the Aeriflex D20 series is where Aerie got into the competition digitally, greeting a camera line that would eventually be touted as the best in Hollywood. But with all the success of this camera line, why did Aerie shock the industry in 2010 with the release of the Aerie Alexa that essentially ended the D20 series for Aerie? And what part did Red have to play in this? Find out today on our Abandoned Camera Series. Like many of these episodes, we have to go back to the beginning to understand why certain names and cameras were so important in the historical sense. So here's a brief history of Aerie to get us caught up to the early 2000s. Aerie was founded in 1917 in Munich, Germany by August Arnold and Robert Richter. Their first commercial products were movie lights and film printing machines. And in the beginning, the boys were not even old enough to legally sign their business documents, but soon expanded into other areas of filmmaking equipment. And by 1936, they had developed the first Aeriflex 35 camera. Even with most of their facility being destroyed during World War II, Aerie was still able to continue their development of cameras post-war, releasing the next generation of the Aeriflex 35. Throughout the decades, they continued making high-quality film cameras that were used to make countless award-winning movies. But around the turn of the century, they had to make a tough decision, stay with film or move into the brand new world of digital. The digital age of film, from my point of view, was primarily the aspect of being able to, to do the finishing of, of an analog negative in the digital realm. That became such an obvious advantage that I don't think anybody doubted that that's where it had to go and where it headed. In the early 2000s, it was a race to see who could develop a digital cinema camera that would be adopted by the film industry. This was a risky proposition since no one was quite sure how digital cinema would be received by filmmakers and audiences alike. But with technology advancing and new and upcoming companies racing to get something out in the market that was hungry for new technology, Aerie couldn't ignore it and started their own development into the world of digital. It's actually quite interesting, historically, for Aerie to have such vision on change to digital in the industry, as many older companies will refuse to change until it's too late and they fade into obscurity. You don't see companies survive often with this kind of industry shakeup. Franz Krauss explained, people thought because Aerie made film cameras, how could they possibly have a successful digital camera? That would have to be luck. No, it wasn't luck, but it was hard work over many years, starting with the Aerie laser and Aerie scan. And the first digital product I ever designed actually was the uh, Aerie laser. The scanner was another development, of course. Both of these products basically paved the way for the digital conversion from analog to digital. They got started with digital sensors by creating the Aerie Scan, which used a version of the Al of CMOS sensor to scan film for major motion pictures, and they released this in 2004 at IBC. The Aerie Scan is scanning 35 or 60 millimeter film, pin registered, with up to 8 frames per second, in 2K or 3K resolution. They, they were the pathway for this transition. And now, of course, what remained of the non-digital group was the camera. The direct output was the D20 camera. It was a very large-scale test because it involved everything that is today necessary for a digital production. We basically had to invent with the D20. The Aeriflex D20 sported a 35mm CMOS sensor adapted from the Aerie scan, and was introduced somewhat quietly in 2005. Aerie didn't make it available for sale, but rather used it primarily as the basis for their digital development program. They didn't even refer to it as a product per se for sale, but rather a technology platform. It could film up to 2880 by 2160 raw 12-bit, and had a mechanical shutter that could go from 11.8 degrees to 180 degrees, with a ISO range from 100 to 800, and the body was actually based on a modified Aeriflex 435 film camera. This camera was passed around in rental environments so Airy could gather data and feedback on it, and of course make additional upgrades to it along the way. But outside pressure was growing for them to release it to the general public for purchase. 
certain uncertainty in the market about what was going to happen with film. How soon would people be changing over to digital technology? And we didn't want to fan that fire by coming up with a digital product too early. achieved what we wanted to achieve. What a lot of people said we couldn't do, we just went out and did it. We got 1,500 or so, uh, slightly under 1,500 reservation holders that are probably thinking they're really smart right now. The Red One was a 4K capable digital cinema camera for $17,500, and it was a game changer as it made digital cinema available for those who could have never afforded one before. This put the rest of the industry on notice, especially with the way Red was able to bring this camera from a concept to a reality a year later at NAB in 2007. But Franz Krauss and the technical team at Aerie ignored the noise. Krauss noted in an interview that to release a digital Aerie camera, it would have to be as good as the capture of film was. We wanted to replicate film in its full perfection. So they pushed on, releasing the upgraded Aeriflex D21 in 2008 and discontinuing the D20. Um, of course, the camera's got its optical viewfinder, key, key feature that's been right from the very beginning with the D21, and it's, it's now the only digital camera available with an optical viewfinder and a 4x3 sensor and the mirror shutter, so it's really becoming unique in more ways than we maybe ever imagined. But even with high praise in the industry for this camera that had been used in films like Shutter Island and shows like Downton Abbey, Airy and its leadership insisted on keeping it still as a rental product that they could continue to build upon. Well, the more interesting workflow, I suppose, is our data mode of working. And that's being demonstrated with this camera here. We're taking our raw data signal, what we call our ARRI raw signal, out from the camera using these two BNC cables here. And those are connected to, in this case, the S2 Take 2 recorder. Now this is an uncompressed disc recorder, uh, which has been specially uh, firmware adapted to understand and, and interpret the ARRI raw signal. The most noticeable difference between the D21 and any other digital or HD camera at that time was the picture quality it produced. The D21 is renowned for a cinematic look that comes very close to 35 millimeter film in terms of sharpness, exposure latitude, and depth of field. It improved upon the D20 in many ways, slowly fighting the early filmmaker concerns of hyper clarity and digital HD that would reveal performer skin imperfections. Aerie intended for it to only be a rental and experimental camera still, but the images coming from the camera were reportedly so good that the demand increased for this camera to be made available for sale, which reluctantly, Aerie eventually did a limited release. With the rave reviews coming out about the Aerie D21, many thought future lines of the Aerie digital cameras would continue through the Aerie Flex D series because of its popularity and growing prestige. But the rise of digital cameras was already underway in the industry, and Red was forcing everyone to get into digital now, or be left behind, as they were yet another step ahead talking about digital cameras that included 28K sensors. Red was already on to announcing their second line of digital cameras, and Sony was not far behind with their F23 and Cine Alta F35 camera by the time Aerie was even releasing the D21 in 2008. It will happen the way water freezes. It will be a few crystals at first, and when a critical mass is reached, it look, goes whoop, and it's ice. And that's how the market would shift from analog to digital. First, lots of skepticism, and then once the critical mass is reached, it will be a very quick changeover, and so it was. 2009 was a very tense and pivotal year for Airy, with a world financial crisis finally hitting the market. Krauss explained that was a time when we suddenly stopped selling film cameras. Younger members of the staff had already been asking for retraining to be prepared for when our digital camera came. The future of the company rested on them being able to release a successful digital camera as sales of motion picture film cameras were slowing down and Red and Sony were eating up the market, while once top of the market companies like Kodak were beginning to implode. And in 2009, rumors began to swirl two months before the IBC convention about Aerie working on a brand new camera line with a brand new sensor. For us, it was very difficult to get the timing right because we had an ongoing strong camera business and we really didn't want to kill the camera business of our own. We wanted just to be prepared uh, when it's going to change that we would have the right offering. This new digital camera needed to be a home run for Aerie's continued success. And on September 10th, 
2009, the doors to the IBC Hall 11 were opened at 10 a.m., and within five minutes, crowds of DPs and rental houses descended on the Airy booth to see the three prototype Airy digital sister cameras that were housed in wooden boxes, codenamed Alexa. So this IBC, we showed the new front end of our next generation uh, digital cameras. Uh, what you'll see over there is a bit of understatement, uh, which says uh, Ari Sensor Demonstrator. In real, it is a functional uh, prototype uh, incorporating our new CMOS uh, 35 millimeter sensor. By the end of the show, the codename Alexa caught on, and the following year, on April 7th, 2010, Airy officially announced the Airy Alexa. Shortly after this announcement, the Airy Flex D21 was officially discontinued, as well as the entire D-Series line. It's hard to blame Airy for wanting to move on from the D21. The Alexa was a monumental achievement in digital cinema cameras. It had a completely new sensor that Airy developed themselves, and was ergonomically superior to the D20 and D21, and and most importantly, achieved the look that Franz Krauss and the Airy technical team had held out for years trying to achieve, a digital cinema camera with a filmic look. Why did they abandon the D20 line though? We can come to some easy conclusions as to the demise of the Airyflex D series cameras. They were touted as being specifically experimental cameras with Airy not wanting to release them to the public until they had the right look and worked out all of the bugs with the cameras. But we can also speculate on the name change here as well, maybe having something to do with Red Digital Cinema. You can see the names and terminologies for their cameras were eye-catching and great for marketing, a massive shift for the camera industry. And this all makes sense when you know former owner of Oakley, the sunglass company, Jim Jannard, the outsider in the film industry, was behind this aggressively successful marketing for Red. Whether or not Red had anything to do with Airy deciding to drop the Airyflex D series name for the Alexa name, the Airyflex D20 cameras paved the way for the Alexa and the future stranglehold that Airy would have on the film industry in the modern world. And though the experimental camera line was abandoned in the end, it's not the sad story it is for many other camera companies in the industry. Airy stands in stark contrast with much of the industry that threw themselves into the digital space as fast as possible possible without working out the bugs in their own cameras first, like the Atten Penelope Delta, which had a similar storied history like Airy, but their switch to digital cameras from film led to their swift demise. And you can hear about that story right here or watch our growing list of abandoned camera series episodes by clicking the playlist here.